2,000 years ago, the angel Gabriel brought a rather unusual message to a little girl named Mary. Behold, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will conceive a child even though you have had no relations with a man. Proving, as they say, that abstinence is 99.9999999% effective. The belief that Mary gave birth to Jesus as a virgin is not, nor has it ever been, a controversial topic in Christendom. It fulfills a prophecy found in the book of Isaiah, and Christians accepted it from the very beginning. The idea that she remained a virgin, however, now that is up for debate. Why do Catholics argue for her perpetual virginity, and when did this belief develop? This is Catholicism in Focus. As with most things in our faith, the first place that we want to look to answer our question is the Bible itself. Although not the only source of God's truth, it is a pretty important foundation. Which is unfortunate for Catholics in this case, as the Bible isn't much help. The best we can say about the perpetual nature of Mary's virginity based on the Bible alone is that it doesn't definitively negate it. It definitively speaks of her virginity and conceiving of Jesus, but then remains silent on any other domestic event in Mary's life. It does, however, offer some contrary evidence, as Protestants like to point out. In each of the Synoptic Gospels, there is a pericope in which Jesus, speaking to the crowds, is informed, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they wish to see you. Jesus, of course, spiritualizes this situation, saying that those who do the will of his father are his mother and brothers and sisters, and that's great for us as a moral lesson, but it does present a practical problem for our take on Mary. Clearly, the disciple didn't mean this spiritually, but literally. He was speaking of Jesus' actual flesh and blood. The same can be seen in the Gospel of John, the Acts of the Apostles, and St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and Galatians, as each reference the brothers of Jesus. Clearly, Jesus had some biological relatives. And the Catholic Church doesn't negate that. We just don't accept that these children are the offspring of Mary. When we look to the actual description of these so-called brothers of Jesus, it's important to note that no one is ever described as the son of Mary. Whereas family lineage is common in other places in the Gospels, as in the sons of Zebedee, these brothers are given no further detail. Of course, this assumes that the word brother actually means what we mean by brother, which is not a guarantee. In the Semitic world, calling someone a brother could be a catch-all for many types of relationships, from stepbrother to cousin to even uncle. In the book of Genesis, for example, Abraham uses the Hebrew word for brother to greet Lot, even though he is in fact his uncle. As if that weren't ambiguous enough, we see in the Gospel of Matthew that two of his disciples, James and Joseph, are at one point referred to as his brothers, but are later described as the sons of a different Mary entirely. All of this helps to understand the scene from John 19 in which Jesus entrusts his mother to the beloved disciple while on the cross. If the Mary, the mother of Jesus, did have other children, Jesus would have had no need to make sure that his mother was cared for after his death, and this scene would make little sense. For many in the early church, passages referring to Jesus' siblings posed no problem to the belief in the perpetual virginity of Mary because many understood them to be children of Joseph before he was betrothed to Mary, or in all likelihood, children from another marriage. Given the world at the time, there is no reason to believe that Joseph couldn't have had other wives and a much larger family. In fact, an early Christian source says just that. In the Proto-Evangelium of James, a partial gospel written about 120 AD, we read, And the priest said to Joseph, You have been chosen by lot to take into your keeping the virgin of the Lord. But Joseph refused, saying, I have children, and I am an old man, and she is a young girl. Now, is this a canonical source binding on all the faithful? Of course not. It was not deemed authentic enough to be included in the Bible, and so we must be wary of taking any of its words as dogmatic truth. What it is, though, is early evidence of a developing popular belief. If we're important enough to be written down in the early second century, it means that there was already a strong oral tradition and popular devotion among the people a generation earlier. Over the next two centuries, the belief in the perpetual virginity of Mary took root throughout all of Christendom, developing a strong devotional following in both East and West. Some, like Tertullian and Helvidius, argued against it, but the vast majority of the church leaders, people like Origen, Athanasius, Basil the Great, Ambrose, Cyril of Alexandria, Pope Leo, Jerome, and Augustine, 
all defended it. And trust me, if you can get Jerome and Augustine to be on the same side of anything, that's a big deal. They did not exactly get along. Eventually, the teaching was so well established among the leaders of the church, with dissenting opinions only coming from minority heretical voices, that the Second Council of Constantinople in 553 definitively referred to Mary as ever virgin, and the Lateran Council of 649 further cemented the teaching's place in Catholic theology. If anyone does not, according to the Holy Fathers, confess truly and properly that Holy Mary, ever virgin and immaculate, is Mother of God, since in this latter age she conceived in true reality without human seed from the Holy Spirit, God the Word himself, who before the ages was born of God the Father, and gave birth to him without corruption, her virginity remaining equally inviolate after the birth, let him be condemned." Clearly, this teaching was well-rooted in the ancient church, but it also persisted. What's probably most interesting about this topic is not that the belief has existed basically since the beginning, it's that it continued unchallenged even through the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. While many Protestants today do not accept this teaching, all of the major reformers did. I am inclined to agree with those who declare that brothers really means cousins here, for Holy Writ and the Jews always call cousins brothers. Martin Luther, Sermon on John. I firmly believe that Mary, according to the words of the gospel as a pure virgin, brought forth us the Son of God, and in childbirth and after childbirth forever remained a pure, intact virgin. Ulrich Zwingli, Corpus Reformatorum. Jesus was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who, as well after as before she brought him forth, continued a pure and unspotted virgin. John Wesley, Letter to a Roman Catholic. Maybe most surprising of all was that John Calvin didn't even think that it was a controversial question. In one commentary he wrote, Certainly, no man will ever raise a question on this subject except from curiosity, and no man will obstinately keep up the argument except from an extreme fondness for disputation. Unfortunately, many people do raise this question today, and I guess you can understand why. Scripture does not explicitly state that Mary remained a virgin. If you're a biblical literalist or a sola scriptura rigorist, that's the ballgame. But really, that's precisely why scripture can't be the only source of truth. It's why we believe that Christ founded the church, that the Holy Spirit continues to guide it, so that when questions like this arise, a generation after the Gospels were written, and the faithful maintain that same belief even through the Reformation, we can know of its truth. It may not be spelled out in the Bible. But when Basil, Augustine, Jerome, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and Wesley can all agree on something, there might be something to it. 